Newfoundland. People with courage and foresight have come to mine this rich land for hundreds of years. Now, the next chapter in Newfoundland's mining history is being written, and it may prove to be the richest chapter yet. To learn more, find us online at newfoundgold.ca. Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix, and joining me today on the program is a new guest, Jan Neuenausch. He's a gold analyst, and he started writing about the economy in 2013 after the great financial crisis under the name Kuz Jensen. How are you today, Jan? I'm good. How are you, Tom? Excellent. You're also known as Jan Gold on Twitter, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I used Jan Gold's Twitter handle because I thought it would be a bit difficult for, because most of my readers and followers are from outside of the Netherlands. And my last name is, I think, quite difficult for people abroad. So Jan Gold is, is maybe more easy for uh, you guys. Excellent. So, Jan, I wanted to get you on the show. We've recently been doing a kind of a series on really having what I hope is a, a healthy debate about what some people see as problems in the COMEX. And I'd like to get your perspective. So let's start by talking a little bit about where the discrepancies lie in this debate and some of the articles that you've written about. it. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I have only written one article recently about the COMEX. And it was because I read something, I believe it was on the Seeking Alpha from Robert Keynes. I think it's an American, so I don't know how to pronounce his last name. But actually, he was writing in his article that there are anomalies, let's say, in the deliveries of the daily deliveries, for example, of the September contract and the change in the open interest. And I commented on that article and I said, well, it's, it's quite easy to explain because there's also trading volume. When a contract expires and you go into the delivery month, but the contracts can still be traded. It's something that maybe some people don't know, but this trading volume explains the, the difference between the deliveries and the change in open interest. So the issue that you were pointing out is that a contract delivered is not necessarily traded, correct? So deliveries are not part of the trading volume. And that explains the difference in the open interest and deliveries, right? Yeah. So if you look at the COMEX, it's a subsidiary from the CME Group. You can go to the CME Group website and look up all the data. Unfortunately, they don't go back years and years and years ago with all the data, but you can get all the data from last week. And if you happen to know some people in the industry, they can supply you all other sorts of numbers. But it's quite clear that the total volume traded of a contract consists of, and you see it here, I'm looking at it, of trading on the Globex, that's the right, the, the 24-7 International Electronic Trading System, Open Outcry. Then you have P&T, which stands for Privately Negotiated Transactions. And those consists of EFP, EFR, TAS, and block trades. So those are all OTC trades, actually. But these trades are cleared through Clearport. And that volume is also added in the total volume. And then, yeah, the CME discloses the total volume traded every day of everything. So the way that you understand that data and look at the numbers, you found no evidence of fraud, correct? Yeah, according to me, there is no evidence of fraud because I think what Keynes has core of the message, because I didn't read everything, Kirian van Hesse and Robert Keynes, I believe they wrote a lot about shadow contracts and all sorts of anomalies. So I didn't read all of that. I tried to debate them, but I think it boils down to just these differences between deliveries and the change in open interest. So, Jan, one of the other things that Bob Coleman had brought up, the other voice, let's say, for the COMEX, was that deliveries of the contracts are dictated by the seller. So have you ever heard of people not receiving their deliveries if they're trying to stand for delivery? No, I've never seen any evidence of it. Of course, there are all sorts of rumors because there are always a lot of rumors about the COMEX, but I have never seen any evidence of it. And if somebody was denied delivery, surely he would reach out to the media or some kind of other financial website to make notice of this because it would be a, a tremendous fraud, but nobody ever did, right? And some people say, yeah, well, they like to stay anonymous and there are a lot of, um, uh, they're in court right now with banks or something, but I've been hearing these stories for a lot of years, but again, I have never seen any evidence that somebody was denied a delivery. Maybe I can add that because I think you said something about what Bob was saying, that Bob was saying that the shorts, the, the sellers, they dictate delivery. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that is because when a contract expires, let's say a September contract, because it's uh, September now, first notice day is, I believe, two or three business days before the end of the month. So on the, let's say, 28th of August, you know, people can initiate their delivery intents at the COMEX. And then when the delivery uh, actually happens, the COMEX will connect all the the shorts and longs and then to decide who is going to make delivery to to who but the thing is that the sellers the shorts can decide when in the month they want to make delivery right so the longs have to wait before the shorts decide to make delivery they cannot say i want to take delivery on this or that day they have to wait for the shorts to decide and usually the most of the delivery uh, takes place at, at the beginning of the month But yeah, a short can also wait until the end of the month to make delivery. So that is a rule. Maybe some people don't know it. And uh, I think that was what Bob was referring to. Excellent. One of the other things that we were kind of chatting about before the call was that if you see a larger than normal or any type of anomaly in the December month, either deliveries or open interest, as you understand the data. No, I don't see any anomaly. This is because futures trading is, of course, for hedgers and for speculators. And a lot of the hedgers are, for example, refineries in the the gold industry, and they want to hedge their inventory. So they uh, take a short position on the the near month and speculators are in that month as well. Most of the open interest is concentrated in the near month and the rest of the futures curve is is less liquid. So what always happens is that you see the most open interest in the near month, which is now December. So if we look now at the total open interest, it's about 550,000 contracts and the open interest of December is 430,000 open interest. So I see it as quite normal. When December will approach, you will see most of those contracts rolling. And by comparison or to compare this situation, for example, in late 2019, the total open interest on the comics was 800,000 contracts. And I'm You know, I I don't keep track of these things, but I'm quite sure that at at the time, most of the open interest was concentrated in the near month as well. So probably December last year was at a much higher open interest. Now, deliveries were lower back then, so even more contracts were rolled. Uh, deliveries are a bit higher this year or especially in the beginning of this year and it's now beginning to lower but no i don't see any problem in in the open interest in the december contract out of the data excellent so Jan, one of the other things as you were speaking about the hedging that some of these miners or other groups are doing i want to get your thoughts on who's kind of playing the arbitrage game between the london exchange and the comex Okay, well, I believe yesterday a story came out from Reuters and they were quoting a lot of billion banks and it appeared that we knew that, of course, in March they got burned because usually they are long in London and they have their positions on the COMEX, so they are short on COMEX, long on London. So when we had the dislocation in the market in March, you saw that a lot of banks got burned because the futures price on the COMEX went up and uh, up relative to the London price. So their positions started bleeding. Now, some of them were a bit panicking and they started selling their position. That is taking a loss. And of course, that even made the situation worse because if you try to get out of your short position, you drive up the price in New York even more. And then we thought, because the spread between London and New York was still very large all through March, April, May, etc. And we thought, you know, I was thinking, and a lot of colleagues of mine, why aren't these banks coming in again? You can make a fortune by, you know, closing these ARPs. All you need to do is hire a plane and, you know, buy London and or, or Switzerland, buy spot, and, and sell it on the COMEX. Now, of course, a lot of people started doing that. And so that's why you saw all this physical gold moving to New York and you saw the warehouses being filled with gold. And uh, so, you know, this was a clear, normal market uh, process because you had a spread and not only the spread between London and the near month in New York, but also between the near month and the next month. And the futures curve was in a very steep contango. You know, it's, it's September now. You could easily, let's say, buy the December and sell a few months out, right? And make a 
quite a significant percentage of, of profit. Now, you know, in, in financial markets, some people, they fight over pennies. And these were just like tens of dollars an ounce on, uh, between contracts. Anyway, so we just figured out that because of these stories, the billion banks told Reuters that the banks were doing the arbitrage uh, as well. And of course, it's quite logic because, you know, if the planes start flying again and the, the, the banks have all the infrastructure, they know all the people, they know the logistics companies. And of course, they made a fortune by doing the ARP and in part also because if you do an ARP, then you also close the ARP. Strange thing is that it's still a bit elevated, the spread between London and New York, but we're also still in this pandemic situation and we have less planes flying. So maybe it's more expensive to move metal from, let's say, Europe to uh, New York. And it's reflected in the spread. So they're basically just trying to kind of capture some profit by trading that spread on the goal that they have kind of just there, right? Uh, you don't have the gold there. You can also borrow money, buy gold in London, and then sell it through a futures contract in New York. And the spread is uh, is the profit minus uh, cost to ship it and insurance costs. But that is a very typical arbitrage arbit uh, opportunity. It always has to do with first lending money. So if you, for example, see a futures curve and you see that a few months out, the gold price is, I don't know, a few bucks higher, that always includes the, let's say, the formula for the futures price is it includes borrowing money, storage costs and insurance. So an arbitrage is not usually done by somebody that has gold. It's about borrowing money to buy it and sell it. Excellent. So, yeah, and there was a recent Bloomberg article that you posted that suggests the optimal portfolio mix of gold to reserves should be at least 10 percent. What are your thoughts on this allocation? Yeah, I think it's quite good. It's like a, a golden rule. You very often hear about 10%. Some people say more, some people say a little bit less. I think it depends on your time horizon and also the size of your portfolio. I think if you are talking about like huge, huge, huge hedge funds, it becomes a little bit more difficult to because the gold market isn't as liquid as, for example, the U.S. Treasuries market. So it's more difficult than to get 10% in gold. But yeah, 10% is fair. I have a little bit more myself, but yeah, I'm probably biased. <laughs> That's fair. What role do you think that silver should play in that as well? And is that just gold and silver physical bullion? Yeah, when I talk about gold, you know, I, I always talk, I'm not a day trader or speculator or whatever. I'm a gold researcher, but when I talk about it, I'm talking about the fundamental reasons to own gold. And that is to hedge yourself against the financial system and inflation and things like that. So, and it only makes sense if you hold the physical gold because everything else is a derivative and a derivative has counterparty risk again, and then it's not insurance. I mean, if you, you own GLD, for example, and the banks that, that operate GLD collapse or are frozen or uh, there's a bank holiday, then, or, you know, or the stock market is closed, then yeah, there goes your insurance. So I'm always talking about the physical gold. With silver, I'm less of a silver expert because what happened, let's say, in the, in the past 100 years is that silver kind of lost its, its monetary purpose. And that is because the last metal standard we had was a gold standard. And after that, of course, we had a floating exchange rates. But the central banks all kept gold in their vaults. They all sold their silver. And a lot of the institutional money and, you know, when economists or people are thinking about a new monetary system or whatever, yeah, it's about gold because also the central banks have gold. And, you know, all these big people like Ray Dalio and the big institutions and even some pension funds now are into gold. So I'm primarily focused for this reason on gold because I think gold will get a new role in the forthcoming monetary system. So that, that's where my focus is on. But my opinion on silver is that in the coming years will probably go up by the same amount as gold does, maybe even more. I see it like this. Gold is the ultimate store of value and silver is its more speculative little brother. So silver can go up even more, but it's, yeah, it's just more speculative because like the big money, the institutional money is more focused on gold. And of course, also there are differences between gold and silver. There is less gold. So your gold vault is a lot smaller and it's cheaper to store and it doesn't corrode and etc. Gold is superior to silver. So I think that the important 
game here is about gold. If you're an investor or a speculator or whatever, there are a lot of opportunities also uh, in silver. But yeah, that's how I see it and the, the differences. Perfect. There was a recent tweet also by Tyler Winklevoss saying that Bitcoin is better at being gold than gold is. Do you subscribe to that idea or what are your thoughts on Bitcoin being better than gold? Well, I think it's silly. I mean, these, some Bitcoin people are just posting silly tweets or write silly things about Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is great. It's a great invention. I think it's just what happens when we develop and technology develops. And I hope it will get a, a role next to gold. But to say that Bitcoin is better at being gold than gold itself is, of course, that, that cannot be true. So that's ridiculous. They both have their pros and cons. I mean, gold is physical. It really, really, really does not, ha does not have any counterparty risk. Also because it doesn't require power or anything. And also it has a track record of, let's say, five, 6,000 years. And it's very evenly spread across the world. So this monetary reset I was just talking about, yeah, gold is really the most suitable asset that can provide uh, stability when the shit hits the fan. And Bitcoin has a lot of other advantages, for example, that you can just send it to your friend at the other side of the world without any bank or government interfering. But it also has its downsides. It's very volatile, constantly needs power. You know, I'm not I'm absolutely not anti Bitcoin, but it just yeah, anybody can make a balance and write the differences and act accordingly or, you know, for investors. I would put a little bit less money in Bitcoin than in, in gold because it's, a, it's, a, it's much more speculative, but it also has a lot more uh, upside. Interesting. So there was another article posted recently that was basically saying that the new Fed policy would not get inflation. How could this possibly be? Was this academic study you refer to? I think you had posted it on your Twitter. Right. About economists saying or having done a study about QE being disinflationary or deflationary. Well, that's actually the next part of my question. How could it possibly be that somebody would say that this much currency creation would not result in inflation? And then the second part of my question would be why they cannot tolerate deflation. Right. Okay. So first about the QE and inflation or deflation, when the Fed creates money that is being brought into the, let's say, economy as base money reserves for banks, and that is only a tiny part of the total money supply and the broad money supply, M2, it's much bigger. And usually when inflation kicks in, the broad money supply increases. And what you see now is that the Fed and also the ECB and the Bank of Japan, they create a lot of base money reserves, but the commercial banks aren't lending that money. So the broad money supply isn't increasing that much. It has changed now because the U.S. government is spending a lot aggressively than in, let's say, 2011 or 2010. So that is why you see a massive money printing by the central bank. But because the commercial bank aren't creating a lot of money, you know, through fractional reserve banking, they could create money out of nothing, as you know. And at the same time, of course, when there's a crisis, you see all these when, when somebody defaults on his mortgage, that money just evaporates. It just is being scraped from the, the balance sheet from, from the bank. So actually the, the money supply contracts. So that's a deflationary force. So you may think that the Fed has printed a lot of money, but that doesn't necessarily mean we get inflation instantly, as we have also seen in QE1, QE2, etc. Now, there are also a lot more other reasons they find now why this QE is working counterproductive, which you know, isn't a surprise because the economy is like a nature. And if you disturb nature, everything just doesn't work how you want it to be. But basically, I think I read a study that QE is giving a lot of companies cheap money. So you get overcapacity, but it doesn't reach the consumers because the commercial banks aren't lending. So consumers demand, aggregate demand doesn't rise, but supply does rise. So that makes QE disinflationary. So you get, you can look at this from a lot of angles, you know, QE also lowers productivity because it's, it, it gives the wrong incentives to managers because they have access to very low interest rates. You can also say that QE causes inequality and social unrest, what we see now. It causes a lot of things which are predominantly bad. But of course, 
I think we will get inflation eventually because, yeah, central banks have entered the dead end street and they can't reverse, is what I like to say. So, you know, the economy has become addicted to uh, once you start to bail out companies, you can't go back, right? I mean, these companies grow bigger and bigger and bigger. You have too big to fill banks. You get zombie companies. I mean, in like 50 or 100 years ago, recession was was welcomed because it would clear out the economy, the, the, the bad sectors, the bad companies that weren't viable and it would make the economy more healthy. But now central banks are very fearful for a recession and because they have created the largest bubbles ever. So they just keep on doing this, hoping that it will sometime be over. But I think it will end in tears. Yeah, there's no real outcome that we can envision that it doesn't end in tears. But why can't the Fed tolerate deflation, Jan? Okay, because deflation is... In essence, there's nothing wrong with with deflation, but the problem for central banks now is because we have never been this much in debt as now. I believe that global debt to GDP ratio is like 350%. And I mean, the debt levels are just staggering. So what happens if you get deflation, prices not only decline, but also wages So if you, for example, have a debt of $100,000 and your wage goes down, the debt burden increases. So then everything becomes even more, the situation becomes even worse. And also, there's also this, you know, general thing that uh, governments do not like deflation because if you have $100 and prices in the supermarkets uh, go down, you become more wealthier, you 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 gain in purchasing power, but th- that's an income that they can't tax. So they don't like uh, deflation for that reason as well. So they always aim for a little inflation to stimulate consumer spending. But we have been in this situation of, of high debt levels for a couple of decades. And this is the reason that deflation is absolutely out of the question. It's kryptonite for central banks. I mean, and and you see how they react now, how fast. I mean, the forces now in this crisis are very deflationary if if the central banks would would do nothing. You know, you got credit collapse, less demand, et cetera, et cetera. But they cannot tolerate deflation and they will do whatever it takes to borrow a phrase to get inflation. And of course, I just told you about how deflation increases the debt burden. If you get a lot of inflation, it lowers the debt burden. So that's the only way to get out of this debt trap. Interesting. So we could see a recent example of this, you know, doing kind of whatever it takes. But by the Dutch government, they issued a 0% coupon for a 30-year bond. Why would they do this and what is this a signal of? They do this because there's a big, big bubble in the bond market, and you can see this by the low interest rates. So, for example, German bonds have negative interest rates in the Netherlands as well here where I live. And of course, the government issues these bonds because, you know, I mean, this is the the best time to issue bonds. So, yeah, because the the, the interest rates are so low, they like to, to borrow money because it's free or even they get paid to borrow money. So that's why they go into the market. And especially, yeah, 30 years is, of course, great. I mean, the longer the duration of the bond, usually the higher the interest rate, because the investor, the the, the lender, wants to have a hedge against inflation. But the market is a bit crazy now. It's monetary madness. So you get this 30-year bond at a 0% coupon. So some people actually lend the Dutch government money for 30 years, and you get nothing in return for the next 30 years. <laughs> Think about it. 30 years. Seems pretty crazy, but who would possibly buy that bond? Well, first of all, you got some pension funds that have to buy these bonds. It's kind of, uh, you know, cooperation between, uh, I think it's even in the law, right? That a lot of the, uh, let's say, pension funds have to invest a significant share in they say safe assets, and they mean government bonds. So yeah, it's it's financial repression, but anyway. There can be, of course, if you know this situation about high debt levels, et cetera, and the central banks can only get out of this by even lower interest rates and even higher inflation. And if you buy this bonds today and the interest rate on it goes down next week or in two months, 
then the value of your bond goes up. So speculators, you know, you know, if you have uh, the, the guarantee of a central bank that interest rates will go even lower, then of course, yeah, a lot of people will buy these bonds to make a profit. But eventually, and that, that's the, you know, they're riding the bubble. So we'll see how it ends. Absolutely, we will. Um, I'd like to go a little bit further east now and get your thoughts on what effect China starting to liquidate its U.S. treasuries could have on the U.S.? Yeah, well, in recent years, there was also always a very spooky scenario and a, a weapon by China because they have, let's say, 1.5 trillion U.S. dollars in, in treasuries. And if, if they would sell those, then, of course, their interest rate would, would skyrocket. But I don't think that's a real danger anymore because this is what the Fed, you know, prints and buys on a Wednesday afternoon these days. So I don't think it's it's a serious weapon for China anymore or a threat to the United States. Very interesting. Um, since the beginning of history, we've seen that whichever country owns the most gold has the reserve currency of the world and also the military power of the world. So who owns the most gold right now and who stands to be the most insulated because of their gold reserves? Well, it's actually quite evenly spread, the gold around the world. And uh, I wrote an article about this, and I think it was kind of orchestrated a little bit, or in any case, the European central banks started selling some of... Uh, after 1971, there was a big problem for the US because Europe had a lot more gold. Let's say Western Europe or Europe, but I mean Western Europe had a lot more gold than the US. So in 71, the US had like 8,500 tons and Europe had about, I don't know the exact number, but let's say 13,000 tons. But of course, this was a problem for, for the US and they tried to they tried everything to demonetize gold and they also used political power and blackmail. Germany, for example, that if Germany would redeem any more dollars for gold at the US Treasury, then the US would withdraw their troops from Germany and not protect them anymore against the Soviet Union. It's funny that the US is now actually withdrawing troops from Germany. And I think there's a possibility that Germany will repatriate more gold from New York. But anyway, coming back to your question, who has the most gold reserves? I think as a monetary union, Europe has. I think China has about, you know, official gold reserves. China has about 5,000, maybe 6,000. They say they have 2,000, but I did some research on it once and I'm quite sure they have at least 5,000 tons. Then we have Russia, which has a little bit less, about 3,000 or something, I think. And the US has 8,000 now. And I think Europe or the, let's say the Eurozone has, I believe, 11,000. So as a monetary union, Europe has the most gold, but we are not united. You know, there's we have a lot of problems here. It's, it's eating away democracy, this European Union. We don't have a united military, so we can't make decisions because these 27 countries have to discuss in 27 languages and uh, etc. So, yeah, Europe has the most gold, but it's not very, very uh, powerful at the moment. The U.S. has its problems as well, and, and China too. So I don't know uh, what the future will hold. Perfect. And since we're talking about that, you have your pinned tweet on your profile links to an article that you wrote titled Europe has been preparing for a global gold standard since the 1970s. So what are the chances of returning to a gold standard? Oh, I don't know. I don't know the chances, but I think it's very likely that I use the term because, it, you know, you, you need a, a title for your article when you, when you write something. And this really was a summary of what I was trying to say. And with a gold standard, most people think about a fixed parity between, you know, let's say euros or dollars and gold. But I don't know if it's going to be a fixed parity system or another system where gold will have a very prominent role. It also can be that, for example, gold will be the world reserve currency in terms of taking up the, the biggest share of international reserves and all other currencies like the euro and dollars and the renminbi and whatever. They just they keep floating around gold. So you don't have a fixed parity, but and then maybe even international settlement is 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 done in gold, and so you get a multi-reserve currency system, and and maybe for transactions, you get fiat currency, but for savings, central banks and pension funds, they all use gold. That is another option. 
that wouldn't fit the normal description of a gold standard, but um, that's possible as well. I think that is very likely that we are moving towards a system that incorporates gold, because like I just said, there is so much debt and there's so much instability right now, and central banks are not in control anymore. I mean, all they can do is print what's the best outcome, inflation, and that the debt burden goes down. But a lot of people will get angry because, and the weakest in society will suffer the most from inflation. So when you get that social unrest and all this anger and and, and everything, you really need to regain trust of the population and gold is uh, very suitable for that. Interesting. So in doing research for this interview, Jan, I came across you saying that you had heard about a certain European banker that wasn't allowed to talk about their policies around gold. Why would that be? Because gold is too important to openly talk talk about. So this was a, a gentleman I know, and he used to work at a central bank in uh, Europe. And when I was researching this article you were, you were just uh, referring to, I ask around, I try to collect sources, read books, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I asked him, like, so what I found was that European central banks in the 90s and also in the early 2000s, they sold gold to equalize gold reserves internationally. So, you know, for example, the Dutch central bank, the Netherlands is a very tiny country. We had, I believe, 1,700 tons of gold, and we sold 1,100 tons of it, and we only have 600 now. And in Parliament here, the Minister of Finance was asked, like, why did we sell all this gold? It was in 2010, I believe, this was raised in Parliament. And he said, well, because we thought we had too much gold proportionally to other countries. And I also got some other sources on, you know, this policy of selling gold to equalize gold reserves relative to other important gold holding nations, it said in the answer of this uh, minister. Anyway, so what happened in 1971 is that Nixon, of course, closed the gold window and dollar holders abroad couldn't redeem their dollars for gold anymore at the treasury. And a diplomatic battle started between Europe and the US. And ever since, there is a lot of evidence that through the decades, Europe has been trying while not talking about it because Central bankers are very concerned with stability. You may be surprised to hear this, but this is their original task. But what they've been trying to do is keep gold in the in the system. And for example, in the 70s, first you had the two-tier gold system. So in the free market, the gold price was allowed to float. But between central banks, there was an agreement that gold could only be exchanged for an official gold price. It was way lower than the free market price. Of course, it didn't make sense, and nobody, no central banker was selling any gold for this ridiculous uh, low uh, price that was dictated by the U.S. So, And this was called the two-tier system. Now, in the 70s, the European central banks were trying to get rid of this two-tier system. Then in the 80s, they uh, launched the European monetary system, which was the precursor of the euro system. And part of this ridiculously complex system was a currency unit, which was called the ECU AQ. And that was partly backed by gold. So there was a bit of liquidity in the gold market again. And also European central banks started leasing gold, you know, lending gold. And I think in part, they also did this to keep the gold market alive, to keep the gold market liquid. Then in the 90s, they started selling some gold, as I just said, to equalize reserves internationally. And all all this are kind of hints that, you know, they they didn't, just like the U.S., they didn't sell all their gold, right? I mean, all these central banks still have gold. That uh, can tell you a lot. I mean, they all hang on to their, to their gold. But if there was some kind of, let's say, plan, or it was just this plan B that was just being uh, developed more and more behind the scenes, then of course it would be far too important to publicly talk about. So to come back to this gentleman I asked about, you know, I asked him, this ex central banker about, did you know, because he worked at one of these European central banks when they sold gold, did you know about this gold policy of equalizing gold reserves? And he says, yes, I knew about it, but I can't talk about it because it's confidential. And I find that I I do a lot of research that I never publish because it's just work in progress and stuff. For example, also send a lot of freedom of information requests to central banks or governments throughout Europe or throughout the world. 
Now, very often get when you ask something about gold, no, that is part of some kind of secrecy act. No information on that. You can ask us anything but gold. So it really tells you that, you know, it's a lot more important than what they want you to believe. Although European central banks have drastically changed their communication about gold in the past, let's say, three, four years. I mean, you must you must have seen these quotes on the website of the Dutch central bank that gold is the perfect uh, piggy bank and it can be used if the system implodes to build up a new system. And the Italian central bank writes on his website that gold is an excellent hedge against adversity and high inflation. And I mean, this is just mind boggling, right? I mean, these are central banks. They have one task and that is provide financial stability. Now, they issue their own currency, but on their website, they promote another currency. So this is, you know, if, if your eyes are open, these are signs of, of developments of, of, you know, they have been repatriating their gold. Certain central banks in, a, in, in Europe have been upgrading their gold to current wholesale industry standards. They changed their communication. In Eastern Europe, they have started buying gold. Hungary, Poland, we know central banks in Asia buy a lot of gold. This is really happening. So that's why to come, because your question was, why can't he talk about gold? Because it was a little bit too important. Because if you openly talk about these things, you will get shocks in financial markets. And central banks like to have stability and things to change gradually. Absolutely. And that's quite interesting and illuminating. So as we're speaking on the 23rd of September here, we've seen the gold price dip back down below the $1,900 level. Could we see, in your opinion, $1,500 gold before another move higher? Mm, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really a technical expert at this moment. I don't think we can go this low because the price of gold in US dollars is very correlated to inflation expectations and interest rates. So you, you must have seen these charts of uh, real interest rates from TIPS bonds, American uh, bonds that are inflation protected. But those rates are actually because those bonds are traded. And what those bonds actually say is what the market expects in terms of inflation. So it can go a bit, of course, interest rates will stay zero for, let's say, the coming years. And inflation expectations can go a little bit lower because we also have these deflationary forces. But I don't think the market is going to expect or we will get like severe uh, real deflation, as in, you know, that uh, CPI will be uh, minus uh, three. Central banks won't uh, tolerate that and markets won't, because of that, markets won't expect that as well. So I don't think we're going to go that low. But it can be a bumpy road, right? I mean, we can get all these economic shocks with the high unemployment, social unrest, collapsing stock markets. I mean, the, the S&P is still very much overvalued. And the reaction of the Fed constantly by printing more money and introducing universal basic income. And we have the elections. And so in the short term, it's very uncertain what will happen. But I think gold is, is going a lot higher because of the inflation that will come eventually. It was interesting. I told you this before we were recording that I was listening to an interview by Nassim Taleb. And he said that if you study inflationary, even hyperinflationary periods in, uh, in history, that it always starts with some kind of deflationary threat. And people think, oh, yeah, well, it's, it's not going to be inflation. It's going to be deflation. And then suddenly, boom, it's going to be inflation. So it, that's kind of uh, fitting for our time. Absolutely. It happens very slowly and then all at once, right? Yeah, it can be. You know, I, I read a book by Milton Friedman the other day, and it, it still has to do a lot with the amount of money in, in circulation. That was what Milton Friedman read, and he showed a few charts. But it's also a confidence thing, right? So inflation is a flight from currency. So if they lose confidence in, in the currency and there's a flight towards commodities, goods, services, and gold, then it kicks in the inflation. Excellent. Do you have anything else you'd like to add as we wrap up here, Jan? No, you had uh, a lot of questions, and I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> we we definitely covered a lot of territory. Um, yeah. The best place to find a lot of your articles are on your Twitter, correct? Yeah, on my Twitter account, it's the best way to follow me because everything I do is uh, on there, yeah. Perfect, and the link to that is also in the show notes. Jan, thanks very much for your time today. Okay, thank you. 
This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?